up, Returners? Welcome to episode 83 of an ongoing series, which is getting awfully close to episode 100. What is it going to be? You'll have to find out. Of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want, and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. And finally, we're taking a look at the last RPG that I really cared about on the Super Nintendo, Final Fantasy VI, or Final Fantasy III US. And since it's special to me, I got a special guest on here today. But I'm not going to waste any more of your time. Let's get going. Conveniently, there's something to look at in the title screen. If we start removing certain layers, you can see that the font used to spell out Final Fantasy III is cookie cut so that different layers of fire could be used to make that effect. In fact, there's different layers of fire that go into making this work. And in the US version of Final Fantasy III aka 6, they use the logo again only it's pure white. Though if you remove those layers again, you'd see that the fire is still technically there, it's just recolored to be completely monochrome white. One of the things that the Super Nintendo is capable of is color filters. You can always layer over something in a Super Nintendo game to give a different effect or a different color. One very common example of this is using a water filter over an empty pool, and Final Fantasy VI is no exception to that. But in two cases here, we have espers with their true color form masked behind something else. The first esper that you ever see in the game, for example, is encased in ice. Now the original esper at the start of the game is revealed to show its true colors in the world of Ruin, but a little to my surprise, the ice is a separate layer from the sprite itself, so that original sprite is present at all times. A little further into the game you see a whole bunch of espers inside our test tubes, and thankfully it's the same case here where if we remove the test tube layers you can see what they look like in their original color palettes. So like I mentioned at the start of the episode, video games are like onions, they have layers. And part of what makes an episode of Boundary Break for a Super Nintendo game at all interesting is removing them and seeing what's behind things. Like here in Narsh, you're supposed to run behind a building, but if we were to remove a layer that has the building textures, you can see there was a path built for Terra to walk on that normally would never be seen by the player. Also, if we choose to remove the layer that hides the slave crown when it first gets presented to Terra, you'll see on the very first frame, which means we gotta freeze it down as slow as we can go, the sprite for this crown is broken up into pieces. Now this wouldn't be seen by the player anyway because it's behind a certain layer and then as it starts to move up into scene it's already assembled. And before we leave Narsh once and for all let's do a zoom out of the town so that we can get the whole thing in nearly one shot. We're going to be talking about Figaro Castle, or Figaro, I don't know. One of the things I found the most interesting in this scene was that when distracting Kefka for a little while, the chocobo that Edgar drops off onto is hiding behind the castle. This is something that the player can see on their own, it's just something I never noticed before. But after extensively covering this game, I learned that that chocobo is absolutely meant to be there for the player to see, otherwise it would have just appeared out of nowhere. Because story scenes in Final Fantasy VI work like this, if something is off screen, it's very very likely likely that it is completely disappeared at that point, or up to that point until they're supposed to be called in. They're nowhere outside of the boundaries. There are very few, very rare instances of this, such as Realm going in the other room of Interceptor and staying in the scene until she's called back, and the ghost that chased after Sabin and Cyan on the ghost train. But for the most part, you're going to see absolutely nothing at all unless the game intended for you to see it. Now as for environments, that's a whole nother story, like the throne room here has a whole bunch of floor tiles that are completely behind the curtains. And you know, while we're still here in the desert and riding on a chocobo, why don't we talk about how these layers work in this scene? See, there's one layer that doesn't move whatsoever, it's right in the middle, and no matter which direction you turn, that's a completely stagnant image. But to give the illusion of moving around on the screen, the top layer is a row of clouds that will pan left and right, depending on which direction you're turning. And then on the bottom half of the screen is a Mode 7 scroll of the overworld. Next up is something that I saw on the cutting room floor, it is a unused environment tile that represents wall chains, and it's meant to be used on this map. By going well outside of the boundaries, we were able to find this unused object amongst the clutter pile of random tiles. And speaking of which, what is up with these random tiles? You'll see these when you go outside the boundaries of many Super Nintendo games. And fortunately, this time around, we might have ourselves an answer. Folks, I'm about to introduce you to the director of the game Sonic 3D Blast, as well as Mickey Mania. He also breaks down his own video games on his YouTube channel Game Hut. So I'll leave it off to you, John Burton. It looks like they used 16 by 16 pixel tiles to make the maps for this game. The map would consist of a list of numbers that told the game which 16 by 16 tile to display in any given area. 
I'd imagine that they have a chunk of memory that they copy the map into at the start of each section. What we're seeing here is probably the remains of a previous level's map data. Possibly this section is smaller, and so it didn't fill the whole of the map memory. The corrupt looking backgrounds are probably the map numbers that correspond to a different set of 16x16 16 tiles for an earlier section. So what we are most likely seeing is the map layout from a previous section, but using this section's graphics. Sometimes when you remove the layers, you can find unusual textures hiding within normal looking textures. Like here at this cave area, obviously if you get to the top of the screen you see the sky background, so you'll see a whole bunch of jumbled up sky tiles, but there's these weird looking tiles mixed in with it that aren't used anywhere. The same thing can be totally said for the island scene, where if you remove the layer that's supposed to have the beach, you can find some really weird bold colored tiles. But one of the things that seems intentional, that doesn't seem to ever be used in the game, are these water tiles underneath the boat. If we remove the boat layer we can find some odd water tiles that don't match up to the water around the dock or any water for that matter which may indicate a beta element that was left behind speaking of boats in the scene where you meet up with general leo and you're supposed to be in the middle of the sea if you walk outside the boundaries you can still find the dock just a little bit jumbled up naturally the camera is never supposed to pan far enough for you to see that but now you can know that at any given point you're in a boat scene in final fantasy 6 the dock is technically not that far away also with General Leo, I noticed that the tent that he stands near when you first see him doesn't allow you to look inside of it. But if we remove the top layer that shows you the inside of the tents, there seems to be a unique map on the table that's not inside of any of the other ones. So with the ghost train, there's some interesting things to be said. One is, if we were to move the camera past the boundaries in certain areas of the forest, you can find the ghost train connected to a texture that on this scene shouldn't have it whatsoever. Also, like I mentioned before, usually when something's off screen in a story sequence, it disappears entirely. This includes a train itself. Normally in this scene, when you detach a train cart, you can see it moving away off screen. But if we were to move the camera into position to see what's going on exactly, you can see chunks of pixels of that train cart just start disappearing appearing instead of moving an environment object. Also, another thing that I have to give credit to the cutting room floor for is an item that's apparently not able to be obtained in the normal game. This was changed in later ports of Final Fantasy VI, but because the game demands that you face this object in a certain direction and you're not allowed to do it, this fairy ring that's just found on the floor is completely unobtainable. And before anyone else, I just want to let you know I hooked you up, guys. I made sure to double, triple, and quadruple check areas like what's beyond Figaro Castle, what's beyond very important key areas, what is inside all the boxes behind all the vendors in the game, where do all the stairs and doors go to behind the vendors. I checked all that stuff, and unfortunately, a lot of them just came up short. It was either that the map would just repeat itself immediately. Sometimes you get some really cool glitch graphics like the coin toss scene here with the Figaro brothers, and a lot of the doors behind the vendors surprisingly do open up but unfortunately they only open up to another wall so if anyone was expecting it to go anywhere I'm sorry to say I checked every single one and none of them really went anywhere although there was one cool thing that I found and it was repeating graphics from characters that are already in the battle scene or just a couple of status effects that were unused that were hidden behind the UI so I asked John from Game Hood about that too and this is what he had to say on that my guess with this is that they had no idea there were corrupt sprites there at all. There was no reason to keep these sprites active behind the UI, and if they had a bug that caused this effect, they would never see it as the UI hides it completely. It looks like there are four sprites active behind the UI. Three are 16 by 8 pixels in size, and the fourth is 16 by 16 pixels. Alternatively, it could be one 32 by 32 pixel sprite with gaps in the graphic data. The sprite, or sprites, was probably used earlier in the game, and this section has put different graphics into the memory that this sprite was originally using, producing this corrupt image. The parts of the character graphic that you can see are a different colour, as this sprite was originally assigned a different colour palette to match the sprite's original graphics. 
This was incredibly odd. At a certain point, you jump off of Baron Falls, and you end up on this screen that you never get to go back to, but you're supposed to move south so that you can get back onto the overworld map. However, for some weird reason, you can move right and exit on the right side of the screen, and this will take you to a completely different spot on the overworld map. And what better time than now to show you a zoom out of the overworld map to give you a better idea of where you end up. Big thank you to John from Game Hut for doing this week's animated intro. Super duper appreciative of that. You are a legend, sir. I love your channel. I couldn't wait to talk about you, so it was, it was great for you to come on and explain a few things. Uh, no one is probably more qualified than the developers of the game itself, so I do appreciate you weighing in and providing some insight as a developer yourself. As far as things on my end, I just want to thank you guys for watching, of course. Uh, I got the panel going on at PAX East on the Friday if you're going to be there, so please show up to the panel. It's going to be at 7 o'clock. And uh, if you like this episode, definitely make sure you check out the Chrono Trigger episode. I know that if anybody watched a Final Fantasy VI episode on my channel, you had to have played Chrono Trigger. Uh, anyways, I'm going to provide a link to that episode, of course. Uh, on the screen right now and as well as in the video description down below with uh, John's channel as well. So guys, thank you so much for watching and uh, I hope to see you next week. Uh, take care.